On the morning of the 5th of May 1986, an 11-year-old girl called Cecile Bloch left her home on the Rue Petit in the 19th arrondissement of Paris at 8.45am. Her parents had only left a couple of minutes before. It's believed she walked to the elevator, pressed the button and waited for the doors to open. Normally she would make her way to the ground floor and then head to school, but this run-of-the-mill journey wouldn't be like any of the others she had previously taken. Unlike previous occasions, she never made it to school and to the sports lesson that was to begin at nine. Her mother called the house phone at noon, expecting to hear the voice of her child. However, no one answered. Knowing how unusual this was, she left work and made her way back home alongside her husband. Finding the apartment empty, she contacted security personnel and a search of the premises began. For several hours they searched. Eventually, at approximately 3pm, they discovered her in what is described as the third basement of the residence. In a small unlit room of the apartment block, used as a storage quarters for maintenance crews and employees, they found the lifeless body of Cecile. She was lying face down with her feet facing the door, underneath a piece of carpet a raised and frozen hand emerging from the makeshift covering. The lower half of her body was in a state of undress and she had sustained a number of scratch marks and bruises to her face and neck in an obvious attempt to subdue her. It was later confirmed that she had been the victim of a vicious sexual assault. There was a stab wound to the left abdomen just below the heart. However, the ultimate cause of death was concluded to be strangulation. A semen sample was taken from the top of Cecile's thigh. Police concluded that the apartment block was known to or had been surveyed by the killer. He likely knew that the elevator only went to the second basement floor and that one had to use a back staircase to access the third and final floor. Investigators hypothesised that the killer waited until the elevator door was open before rushing from behind Cecile and bundling her into the lift. He then brought her down to the second basement floor and walked her the rest of the way to the less utilised third. Cecile's half-brother would state that he's seen a man in the elevator on the day of the murder. Other residents also drew attention to this unknown character. He was described as 185 centimetres tall, of athletic build, between 25 to 30 years of age, with brown hair and a face that was pockmarked. It was this last feature that would lead to the moniker Le Grel, which translates as the pockmarked man. Luc Richard Bloch, Cecile's 24-year-old half-brother, told a newspaper 30 years later that, quote, At 8.20am, I waited for the elevator in the dark because the light on the third floor landing didn't work. When the elevator door opened, a man was already inside having pressed the minus two button because the red light was on. I pressed the button for the first floor. I seen him from the back and he said hello to me. He was between 25 and 30 years old with short brown hair and a parting that went to the right. He had to be around 1.85 metres tall because he was taller than me. He had a medium body type. He dressed in slightly faded jeans, a light jacket and worn out blue or black striped adidas sneakers. Not only had Cecile's half-brother seen him, her parents also saw him in the elevator when they were leaving for work at 8am, though they admit to not paying much attention to him. Six other neighbours reported seeing a man fitting the same description between 7.55 and 8.45am. The last person to see the man was a lady who saw him run out of the freight elevator across the lobby and the Rue Petit. This sighting was at approximately 9.15. The first victim of the man who would become known as Lagrel was an eight-year-old who was given the name Sarah A by police and media. 
investigators noticed some key similarities straight away. On April 7th, 1986, she was sexually assaulted in the fourth basement of a building in the 13th arrondissement by a tall man she met in the elevator. Sarah would survive and was later confirmed as his first victim. A third and fourth victim were found on Wednesday, April 29th, 1987. Alan Vasquez, the lead investigator from the Parisian crime squad, was summoned to an opulent building at 7 Rue saint croix de la Bretonne in Paris's fourth arrondissement. When he arrives, he encounters what he later describes as, and I quote, the most extraordinary crime scene of his career. Deep in the attic apartment of the top floor, in a child's bedroom, the family's German au pair, Ermgard Müller, age 20, is, quote, hanging by the arms to the uprights of the bunk bed, unquote. Her legs are apart, she is bound with various makeshift ties, gagged, positioned as if crucified and dead. Her long brown hair and, quote, head bent forward, unquote, concealed her throat, which was encircled by her bathrobe belt and had also been slashed with a kitchen knife. In the same attic apartment, her employer, 38-year-old Gilles Politi, is also found dead. It's determined that he was garroted. Later examination would show that both victims had been tortured with a knife and cigarettes before being killed. The initial theory amongst investigators was that Ermgard was in a relationship with the killer. Jean-Claude Desay is quoted as saying, this crime's coolness and technicality are terrifying. There was no breaking. Police begin to ask the question, what if the killer was a member of the police? When approaching his victims, he puts on a ruse, showing police ID, a handgun, handcuffs, a walkie-talkie, and he speaks police jargon. With this theory in mind, they search police records, looking for former officers, with sexual assault allegations made against them. In 1996, a judge asked that further examination of evidence take place. DNA was obtained and it came to light that the man known as Legrel was responsible for several rapes, in particular those of a 26-year-old German woman in May 1987, a 14-year-old teenager in October 1987, both in Paris, and that of an 11-year-old girl committed after being kidnapped in the forest in June 1994 in Mitri, Sene Marne. In all of these cases, he pretended to be a police officer. The last murder believed to be the work of the killer was that of a 19-year-old by the name of Corinne Leroy. Corinne was found dead on the edge of a wooded area in monceau le on the 12th of July 1994. She had gone missing on her way to high school a month before on June 9th. When she is discovered, there is an electric cord forming a noose with a piece of wood to facilitate strangulation. Though they were not able to find any DNA on the remains of Corinne, they know that this form of strangulation is indicative of Legrel. The last known victim of Legrel was a young girl named in the media as 11-year-old Ingrid. She was sexually assaulted on June 29, 1994 in Mitri Mori, Sene Marne. A man impersonating a police officer approached her, coaxed her into his car and abducted her. The girl provided investigators with a description of the vehicle. It was a white Volvo registered 91 with the left side in poor condition and a black striped spoiler at the rear. Legrel then handcuffed the young girl and took her to an abandoned farm in Sackley Esson. The sexual assault took place in a farm room. According to reports, the young girl was discovered tied to a radiator. Near her, investigators discovered a paper handkerchief containing the murderer's DNA. 35 years after, the man known as Legrel was identified. On September 29, 2021, the body of Francois Virov was discovered in Gros du Roi near Montpellier. Virov committed suicide after he was asked to give a DNA sample. He was said to be one of 750 gendarmes, French paramilitary police officers, summoned for questioning on September 29, 2021, after authorities suspected the killer worked in security services. 
Knowing the game was up, he left his home, drove to Gros du Roi, wrote a suicide note in which he confessed to a number of murders and sexual assaults. He made it a point to admit he was the infamous Le Grel. DNA tests have since allowed the link to be established between five murders and sexual assaults committed in the Paris area between 1986 and 1994. Verov was a retired gendarme who had previously worked as a police officer. According to the prosecutor's office in Paris, Le Grel was wanted for rape of minors under the age of 15, murder and attempted voluntary homicide. The victim's lawyer, May Didier Saban, said, and I quote, It's unknown whether he has committed any other murders or sexual assaults. We can't believe he stopped. Further investigation is required to determine what other crimes he may have committed. According to Le Parisien, if five of his victims are identified with certainty, no fewer than 28 cases could be linked to him. According to one of his friends, Virov had a passion for horror films, of which he preferred a rather controversial subgenre, Italian films from the 1970s and 1980s with recurring themes of cannibalism, rape and torture. According to the same source, he was particularly interested in one of the period's most brutal works, Cannibal Holocaust. François Verov, according to criminologist and legal expert Michel Agrippard Delmas, was quote, a guy with impulses of death, mutilation, destruction and perversion. He's created that way. He was most likely enthralled by movies or works of fiction. It's common for these criminals to do what they have seen or read, but this is not always the case. It has been said by police and lawyers for the families that there will continue to be investigations into other crimes Virov may be responsible for. Being able to put a face to the moniker given has allowed living victims to allay fears that have existed surrounding the possible re-emergence of their attacker. Though it's a benefit to know who the man is, it's also important to remember that the victims and the victims' families of those that were ruthlessly killed will never get any real answer as to why this happened. We know from the suicide note that he had not been in a good state of mind, but had later, quote, sorted himself out. Such a sign-off is small comfort to the families and others seeking answers. Once again, thanks to everyone for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please do make sure to like, comment, share and subscribe to Mystery Scope. As always, until the next time, do take care.